Thank you. And our speakers today are have all been guest editors on special issues. Um, the first one on human rights in sport and leisure that was published in uh, 2024. And then the other two, leisure, the environment and sustainability and human multi-species conflict are both in process. So our aim in this panel was to bring these topics into conversation, to consider some timely questions about the changing relationships between sport and the environment, um, injustices, and broadly how our understandings of human and more than human uh, is impacting these debates. So we hope the panel will highlight some of these issues and the ongoing need for us to consider what human and more than human rights look like and how these play out in issues of access, in participation and experiences of sport leisure and the impacts of or on the environment, sust sustainability and issues like climate change. So I guess that's, you know, some of just some of the background to, to why we're doing this. And we've asked each of these panelists to speak to their special issue and some of the key issues that it raises. So our first speaker will be Alan Tomlinson. Um, he's Emer Emeritus Professor uh, of Leisure Studies at the University of Brighton in the UK. And Alan's gonna speak about human rights, sustainability and legal frameworks. Following Alan, we will have Tommy Langseth, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Sport, Physical Education and Outdoor Studies at the University of South Eastern Norway. And Tommy will be focusing on leisure, sustainability and power. And last, we have Rebecca Olive, who is Vice Chancellor's Senior Research Fellow um, at uh, RMIT in Melbourne, Australia, and she's associated with the School of Global Urban and Social Studies. And Rebecca will speak on human, non-human conflict, ethics, relationality, pedagogy, and power. So a really exciting um, lineup here, very excited. <laughs> you, can, you can see the speakers are smiling, so I hope they're excited too. Um, each speaker is going to, to talk for around 10 minutes and then we'll open up the, the floor for discussion. And then at the uh, to close the panel, um, Louise, who is our discussant, is going to draw together some of the key issues and um, some of the thought-provoking questions. So finally, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, a reminder that the session is being recorded and that this recording will be posted online. Um, the plan is it for, to be the ISSA website, but it may be a, a dedicated YouTube channel. Um, so essentially by participating, you're indicating your consent. So um, if, that's, if you don't want to be involved in a recording, I suggest you turn off your video stream. I've um, Second reminder is that I've muted, I believe, um, everyone at this point, um, but just at, later into the discussion, just be, be mindful of um, whether your um, audio is turned on or off. And finally, in terms of asking questions, you have a couple of options. Please do use the chat facility. Um, send that to me um, or to all, not to the participant or the speaker, sorry. And I'll check those and, and come back to you. But you can also use the raise hand button um, as another option. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to check that Alan is um, unmuted. He is. And I will now mute myself and hand over to Alan Tomlinson. Off we go. Thank you very much. My comments today are generated by reflections on a special issue of Annals of Leisure Research, guest edited by myself, Gokpan Demirbas and Mark Turner. Mark and I have been co-conveners for the British Sociological Association's Leisure and Recreation Study Group for several years. These study groups have been a mainstay of the BSA since the 1970s at least, and have consistently sought to bring together in the same spaces new and mid-career academics and well-established, experienced scholars and researchers. The BSA has over several decades developed support mechanisms for such groups, 
And these have enabled workshops to develop into conferences and identified potential collections that might also develop into special issues or SIs of journals and or edited volumes for a BSA publications list. Thus, what I'm going to draw on today emerged in that traditional model, leading to an SI with the title Leisure for All, formulating the right to leisure as a radical demand for democratic citizenship. Uh, we would like to highlight the excellent support that was made available to us by the co-managing editors of the journal, Louise and, and Belinda, who are here today. A BSA workshop staged online in January 2022 matured into volume 27, issue three of the annals this year. The intent of the editorial trio was relatively simple. We aim to unpack the significance of leisure as a public good and the cultural formation representative of human citizenship rights. In the contributions to the workshop and the finalised SI, sport was the most prominent recurring topic, though contributors came from not just the sociology of sport, but also cultural studies, sociology of education, health, tourism and urban studies. All told, the SI includes eight articles and comprises three thematic sections initially addressing our overall understanding of leisure as a human right and mapping the history of the right to leisure as developed in declarations of international bodies, and then exploring a range of topics including children's sport and leisure, football spectatorship, national sport policy and radical alternatives as inspired by critical theorists. Overall, the collection looks to first contest contemporary forms of leisure and sporting practice that compose both directly and indirectly threats to the sporting and leisure environments of citizens, and second, seek sustainable solutions or speculative uh, possibilities uh, to widespread possible problems of inequality of access and participation in leisure and sporting spheres. The wide range of articles and arguments covered in the SI raises questions in relation to emerging concerns with the excluding discriminatory forms of leisure and sporting experience that underpin contemporary leisure cultures and in multiple contexts and settings uh, undermine human rights principles. And this raises the question of how forms of change or cultural innovation are or are not established and embedded in various societal contexts across the range from a dictatorial state to the liberal democracy. Answering such questions demands a realistic grasp of sociological principles, of an understanding of how power works and is distributed across contemporary societies and social formations, of how, too, active interventions can fuel the motor of social change for the general good, uh, if not the admirably ambitious, though often elusively utopian goal of social emancipation. There are persuasive analyses and convincing arguments running throughout the eight articles, but one particular issue, for me at least, lurks in the background of some of the analyses and debates, the place and significance of legal frameworks and their effects on both the nature of sport and leisure and the provision of access pathways that are essential to the cultivation of an accessible and potentially participatory citizenship. The Annals Collection alerts us to the multiple settings and situations in which the experiences of sport and leisure practitioners and participants do not include any explicit commitment to the right to, the right to leisure. For the most part in the reported cases, the possibility of interventionist action and potential legislative innovation that could create socio-cultural change appeared limited, despite a deepening of the recognition of the abuses of human rights in the varied settings. And we know that such abuses are widely denied in settings such as sport mega-events, as lucidly demonstrated in John's, John Horne's article in Leisure Studies, published in 2017 to 18, uh, entitled Understanding the Denial of Abuses of Human Rights Connected to Sports Mega Events. Uh, John focused upon the Men's World Cup in Brazil in 2014 and the Summer Olympics and Paralympic Games in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, reminding us that the Human Rights Watch annual report of 25 identified several human rights abuses 
linked to sports mega events. Eviction of citizens, exploiters and abuse of migrant workers, silencing of rights activists and civil society, intimidation of threats to and arrests of journalists and discrimination within competing nations. But as he strongly asserted, in many cases, little action has been taken in response to the recognized abuses. Therefore, John concludes, the struggle over human rights abuses must operate as an ongoing one that necessitates, whatever risk might be involved, development of a critical stance drawing upon the analyses of academic research and critical investigative journalism, informed by and informing the work of activists, unquote, alongside the development of local coalitions based in bottom-up sustainability. But the question and, and the, of the nature and complexity of sport governance still calls for increased attention. Within the SI, the special issue, she Seamus Byrne and Jan Andre Lee Ludwigson provide perspective on the place of law and legal systems in relation to sport and leisure cultures and practices. Byrne, a specialist legal scholar, and his co-author Ludwigson, a social scientist, represent a powerful academic partnership whose analysis points towards the need continually to examine the nature of the relationship between forms of internal sport law as adopted by governing bodies of sport and practiced by internal regulatory bodies and external sport law as anchored in the legal infrastructure of states and governments or collective entities such as the EU, European Union. Byrne and Ludwigson invite us, the title of their article is Further Towards the Right to Safe Leisure, uh, and there's a case study of the Council of Europe's 2016 Saint Denis Convention. They focus on the Council of Europe's Convention on an integrated safety, security and service approach at football matches and other sports events. Sorry about that wordy description, it is in quotes, as a legal space through which the relationship between human rights and safe leisure can be articulated and established. The analysis is anchored in the context of the professionalisation and commercialisation of European sports events, notably football, which are increasingly characterised by neoliberal consumption patterns and regulatory practices. Together, the authors pose important questions on sports events as sites of leisure and insecurity, informed historically by genealogies of European countries and institutions' responses to violence in football and widespread and persisting discourses of leisure mi misbehaviour. Their main focus is upon how the St Denis Convention, seeking to ensure the social, political, economic and legal landscapes in which sport now occurs, moves beyond a violence-focused perspective on spectatorship towards an integrated approach based on safety, security and service. This, they argue, represents an important legal instrument which operates to reimagine sports spectators' right to leisure as, and I quote, the right to safe leisure, unquote. In this context, human beings should be free and able to participate in leisure life, as in the cultural practices of a community sports stadia, whilst being free from the risks and harms. Football spaces are often the site of risk, of course, encompassing, for example, event mismanagement approaches, direct physical violence and expressions of homophobia, racism and sexism. And Byrne and Ludwigson argue that the principle of the right to safe leisure is only achievable in practice through the intervention of the convention, the series convention, which they state provides a, quote, legal pathway to, quote, unquote, towards the right to safe leisure. Yet, there remains no guarantee that governing bodies of sport would support such right to leisure arguments unless pressurised by individual states and governments signing up to the principles of the Council of Europe. Sociologically speaking, we are, after all, addressing these issues as participants in an ISRA event. I believe that we need to generate many more studies of how sport practices, policies and cultures might be developed in alignment with accepted human rights principles, anchored in legislative frameworks appropriate to particular socio-cultural contexts. Only this week, last evening in fact, in 
my, my case, a new UNESCO report has reaffirmed, quote, the right to participate in sports, unquote, as an element of participation in cultural life though alongside the recognition that there are obstacles, another quote, obstacles to the realisation of that right, unquote. Such obstacles are catalogued in the report and evidenced by what is essentially sociological research. As we've seen, human rights can be abused across different societal cultures and political formation. They are also not infrequently disputed and contested. The sociological task must be to understand more fully how forms of sport and leisure have been and may be opened up to all parts of a community and a society in ways that are sensitive to contextual from environmental threats to existing cultures and their relation to political history. The provision of access pathways to sport and leisure capable of both breaking barriers to participation and questioning the dubious regulatory practices of established institutions of sport governments remains paramount. I, I think I managed that in just under 10 minutes or so. So thank you for your att attention and possible patience. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. Very thought provoking. Um, as I said, if you've got questions, do feel, and you want to just get them out there, do feel free to put them in the chat. But we will now move to Tommy. Um, I just need to unmute you, Tommy. We have a look. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. I'll now mute myself. Good. Uh, and uh, thank you for the... Uh, introduction, Belinda. As Belinda says, said, I'm an associate professor uh, and a sociologist at the University of Southeastern Norway. Uh, and in 2019, I think it was, we hosted the uh, uh, European Association for the Sociology of Sport conference here at the campus where I'm based. And the main Theme or the main topic for the conference was uh, sport and the environment. And after the conference, we, uh, we, uh, me and some colleagues, we edited edited a special issue in Frontiers and Sports and Active Living on this topic. Uh, even though we got a lot of lot of good articles, we felt that that power was missing in these articles. So a few years ago, we proposed a special issue on this topic in the Annals of Leisure Research. So the reasoning behind the proposal uh, is that sustainability has become a crucial part of leisure activities for many, both many stakeholders and many participants. But Implementing the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals can be a challenge due to their ambiguity, maybe, and also their vagueness. So it's very often up to the organizations and participants themselves to interpret and apply these goals in their sports and ac leisure activities. So in the call for papers, we, we invited contributions that look at how power is manifested in sustainability and leisure. That is how the power to define what it means to be sustainable is uh, defined, how and who influences the sustainability agenda, how participants respond to sustainability strategies, and what drives greenwashing in leisure. So we got 10 articles, and we are just uh, waiting for one or two articles that are still uh, being revised, but we will soon publish the whole special issue. And... Uh, this uh, special issue is uh, co-edited uh, with Per Ingvar Haukland, Heidi Stavrum, and Richard Giulianotti and myself. 
so what I'm going to do now is just to I've, I've picked three articles that I'm going to talk a bit about. One article that is about outdoor activities, one uh, article about uh, sports and the IOC, and one article about the music industry. So the first article that I'm going to talk a bit about is has the title Discourses on Friluftsliv and Environmental Awareness in Norway, 1960 to 2000. And it's uh, written by Kleng Asia. I think the article is accepted, but I don't think it's published uh, yet. Uh, this article takes a critical look at the Norwegian Friluftsliv's uh, discourse. And Friluftsliv is just the Norwegian term for outdoor activities. Uh, and in particular, it looks at representations of Friluftsliv as an environmentally friendly activity and as a tool for promoting an environmental awareness. So, um, Asia uh, says that the link between outdoor activities and environmental awareness is strongly emphasized in this in the Norwegian discourse. So there is a link in people's uh, minds between being doing things that are good for the environment and participation in uh, outdoor activities. But the validity of this claim has been questioned by researchers uh, for the last two decades, as uh, studies have shown that friluftsliv or outdoor activities contribute significantly to Norway's overall environmental impact. Uh, actually, when it comes to energy use, outdoor activities is among the worst leisure activities you can participate in. So what Asia is doing in this article is to investigate the roots uh, of the idea that nature connectedness is related to environmental behavior. And it does this in a Norwegian setting. So he seeks to examine how these representations of friluftsliv or outdoor activities have become such a pervasive aspect of contemporary friluftsliv discourse in Norway. More particularly, he examines how a small but influential group of people got to define outdoor activities or friluftsliv in the 1960s and how this has uh, implicated that the relation between outdoor participation and being environmentally friendly has been taken for granted. So this has been taken for granted in Norway, particularly in higher education, government policy, and various organizations. And he, Asia, argues that this discourse has become entrenched shaping perceptions and behaviors around outdoor activities. So while, for instance, educational institutions promote friluftsliv as a sustainable practice, Asia raises essential questions around this. So he asks if this narrative genuinely encourages sustainable practices or it or if it obscures the need for substantive changes. So Asia calls for a re-evaluation of the current discourse, emphasizing the need for a more critical approach. Uh, next, we turn to an article by Renan Peterson Wagner and Jan Andrea Lee Ludwigsen and their article called Staging Sustainability Practices on YouTube, an analysis of the International Olympic Committee. So this work critically examines how the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, presents its sustainability efforts through 
their YouTube platform. platform. And the authors argued that the IOC primarily use, uses niche outlets to communicate its sustain, sustainability practices, aiming to reach specialist viewers who can amplify these positive messages. So the authors highlight the power relations within the IOC, emphasizing how these dynamics influence the organization's engagement with social media. By focusing on niche platforms, the IOC appears to curate a, specific, a specific image of itself as a leader in sustainability. However, the authors raise questions about the effectiveness of these strategies. While these efforts may create a positive narrative, they may not significantly address the pressing issues of climate change and environmental degradation that the global sporting community faces. And now let's turn to the third article that I'm saying something about today. It's written by Sigri Reusen and colleagues. And it has the title, The Cultural Dissonance of Sustainable, Sustainable Live Music. And it examines the tensions that musicians face in aligning their career ambitions with uh, environmental values. Uh, so the authors use the concept of Cultural dissonance describing the conflict musicians experience as they navigate competing prior priorities within their pro professional lives. That this, they both want to take care of the environment and they want to tour and take care of their own careers. So, um, Rei Seng and her colleagues emphasizes that understanding these dynamics is essential as environmentalism is increasingly becoming a sig significant form of cultural capital in the music uh, industry. So the article highlights how different principles of hierarchization coexist within music, influencing how artists navigate their careers and commitment to environmental values. Uh, Rei Seng and her colleagues argue that further research is needed to explore the, the, these dynamics across different musical contexts and inform broader discussions about sustain, sustainability in the arts. So in conclusion, the articles that I've talked a bit about today and the other articles in this uh, special issue underscores the necessity for a critical examination of how power relations shape discourses around sustainability in sport and leisure activities. As we navigate these challenges, it becomes clear that understanding these dynamics is crucial for fostering genuine sustainability in sport and leisure practices. So these insights encourage us to engage critically with narr narratives surrounding sustainability claims in sport and leisure. By recognizing a contradictions and power structures influencing these discussions, we can work toward a more meaningful and sustainable practices. And I think I'll stop there. Is that okay, Belinda? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Rebecca. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm in Australia, so we have a practice of recognising the country that we're speaking from. And I'm speaking tonight in Nam, Melbourne, and that's the country of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups. And so I recognise um, that they're the traditional custodians of this land and that this land was never ceded. And I pay respects to their elders, past and present, 
And I also recognise the work that the young people are doing, um, especially in the topic I'm talking about, we're talking about tonight around environments. Um, so I'm talking about an issue, I'll talk uh, a bit more loose than uh, Alan and Tommy, because our special issue is in its very early days. So we've just had an expression of interest closed. And we ha so I'm going to talk to you a bit about what's come through um, and the themes that are emerging in that and why we put the special issue together in the first place. So I'm um, working on this project with Ben Cook, who's a colleague of mine here in the Centre of Urban Research. And Ben's a geographer and he works in conservation and he does a lot of work in plant mobilities, which is so interesting. So he studies about how plants can't be contained and they cross over um, uh, private uh, land holding boundaries. Uh, he's also looked at sand and how that moves across boundaries. And he also does a lot of work about land back um, with traditional owners as well. So he's, it's wonderful working with Ben on this because I've got a, I've um, had a look, a lot of interest in animals. And so bringing Ben in to think about plants with me <laughs> has been really fun. And so our special issue is about human multi-species conflict in sport and leisure. And it sort of responds really to there's a, there's a growing interest in multi-species um, encounter and interaction in sport. And Dan B. Dashburn Finkel did a great spe uh, special issue on this in Leisure Studies in 2019. Um, and it really reflected this growing interest in what they termed multi-species leisure. Uh, and I learned a lot from that special issue. Uh, they really focused on interactions um, that were quite often positive, though. Um, so they were looking at a lot around um, human health and well-being and positive human animal relationships and interactions. So there was a, a large focus on uh, pets, like domesticated animals such as cats and um, dogs and some interesting work on sporting relationships with dogs where people would share a running relationship, like really interesting work, as well as on horses. Um, there was a paper, a really interesting paper on insects by an Australian, which is not surprising um, at all that the Australian produced that. Um, but, yeah, this focus on often positive relationships of love and intimacy and care for it that happens between the relationship between people and animals um, hasn't really always been my experience of sport and leisure and so or, be, or represented in Ben's work. So what we wanted to do was expand these discussions of, of human rights um, in, and, and bodies, different kinds of bodies, the relationalities between these things, thinking about human more than human ethics and spaces and cultures and communities. And we wanted to think about that across sport and leisure studies. So that was the impetus for the special issue was uh, really just trying to expand this this interest that people have in the in the multi species both to think about that in terms of plants but also to think about some of the more um, challenging aspects of those encounters and intimacies um, which can lead to conflict and we have a lot of examples of those here in Australia um, a common one in cities is between people and bats bats colonize trees because that's where they live and they uh, create a lot of um, guano, <laughs> a lot of noise, and they stink. And so people don't like them living in that area. And there's often they're trying they shoot sort of fireworks and flares into these trees of these critters. Um, there's big tensions between every you know in lots of places between leisure activities and then shorebird uh, health and well-being on coastlines. So shorebirds are very skittish little creatures, and they'll take off very easily and abandon their almost useless nests. I mean, their nests are terrible, so, you know, there is that. But they take off really quickly if someone's near them. And so if people are dog walking or um, four-wheel driving or even crossing the beach to go surfing, it, it can create really negative outcomes. In the UK, there's a huge focus on um, bacteria and algae in, in outdoor swimming. We just ran an outdoor swimming forum at Windermere and it was almost like I couldn't believe the level of discussion on sewage and blue-green algae. So there's there's a really strong focus on plants as well. So there's these conflicts are being discussed a lot, but it, I really we really wanted to expand them. 
Um, and so we promoted it across our networks in sport and leisure studies, hopefully all of you saw it, um, but also in, you know, my other home in cultural studies, in Ben's home in geography and conservation, and also across the environmental humanities. And um, so it was exciting to, to really push it out quite broadly. And uh, we did push the, we really, really tried to push that definition of multi-species to include animals as well as plants, but also we were really open to hearing about bacteria and viruses and, you know, maybe there was going to be more. Like I would have loved to have seen a paper on alien sightings or something, right? So, you know, we, we didn't get one, <laughs> but, you know, if anyone out there is interested, get in touch. But so we were really trying to be expansive on that. But Ben and I also really have tried to adopt a very broad understanding of ecology. And so our understanding of ecology is not just about the natural environment, but also about thinking about the natural environment is including economies, technologies, laws, and I mean that by L-A-W and L-O-R-E, histories and ancestors and spirits and also potential futures. So histories and futures and, and different systems that, that shape our lives in place, that shape the natural world and shape human relationships to these worlds. So in terms of the submissions we got, I forget how many we got exactly, but I think there's 16 submissions. So there are expressions of interest at the moment. So, you know, we'll, we'll of course, it can play out a bit differently. But we got um, a lot of, uh, we got submissions ranging from organised and competitive and professional sporting contexts to very recreational, informal lifestyle activities and also team and individual sports. Um, we also got some on non-sporting non leisure activities, but fewer. Um, we got submissions um, from Australia, Canada, China, England, Scotland, the USA. Um, and I, I, I very specifically said England and Scotland rather than the UK because they are about different um, contexts. Um, they're quite multidisciplinary, so there's people from geography and ecology, cultural studies, sociology, environmental humanities, and tourism studies. So it's very diverse in the in the people who have been interested in this. The animals or the critters, I should say, not just animals because it's multi species. So the critters, to use Donna Haraway's term, that that um, some of them that are represented. I had a quick look. Um, so there's cats and birds, there's sharks, bacteria, orcas, penguins, fish, nocturnal marsupials, uh, insects, weeds, fungi and jellyfish. Um, I think there's more, but I think that's enough for now. And then the context in which these encounters are happening include airports, cafes, beaches, oceans, rivers, golf courses, football clubs, zoos and with yachts, the orcas would have given that that away. So it's it's pretty broad and and really exciting, and we're very excited about the you know the expressions of interest that have come in. Um, and we we worked kind of we yeah anyway we're very excited about this. And so in terms of the emerging debates and themes that are coming, and you know after listening, I, I'm lucky because I get to go last, so I've heard what Alan and Tommy have had to say too. Um, so I think there's a lot for us to talk about. But I haven't mentioned the theories that are being drawn on in this yet because, um, it, I mean, it's an expression of interest, so it's always difficult to see what people are, are doing in those ways. But but what I could see coming through, um, there's a, you know, it, these discussions really require relational understandings of power ethics and pedagogy. So they can't just be about an imposition of power on someone. It's it's actually very relational about the power each actor has or is negotiating. Um, in that sense, for me, it's quite like, you know, Foucauldian, um, but it's also much more than that because it's very, there's a lot of influence from non-Western um, traditions of thinking. There's not one dominant framework coming through, which I find really interesting in this field. So it's not like those, you know, heydays of Bourdieu, <laughs> the dominant heydays of Bourdieu and Foucault and even I think more recently the, the new materialisms kind of have been very dominant in some discussions about certain topics. And from looking across these discussions, there's, that's not happening in this field, like in this line of thinking. Um, I think... Uh, What's interesting is seeing, like, think about, Alan, your discussion, how those issues around right, human rights and then issues of safety become framed very differently once you start thinking about 
humans in relation to non-human. So that's really interesting. Um, and how different the national context, and, and we don't have a, like a huge different range of national context, but, you know, how different thinking about risk is in the UK as opposed to Australia for outdoor swimmers. So risk in the UK is very much thinking about sewage pollution and blue-green algae blooms, whereas in Australia, swimmers are thinking a lot more about currents and sharks. Um, and if you're up north, crocodiles, which, uh, I mean, oh, uh, gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, in some countries more than others, and, and having just recently been in the UK and listened to so many people talk about swimming, what's really interesting is, like, where the discussions around colonisation and decolonisation are coming from um, and where they're just, where who's struggling to even engage with them. And um, so we're hoping to push that a bit in this special issue as well because once you start thinking about relationality and the non-human, those discussions become very complex in the in the context in which we're working in an anti-colonial and decolonising kind of era um, yeah, so I will also leave that there <laughs> um, and pass it back to you, Belinda. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to open up for questions. Do you want um, me to do the discussant bit, Belinda? Uh, oh, I thought, are you going to do that at the end or do you want to do I, that yeah, first? Okay, yeah, yeah, I can do it at the very end. Perfect. Yeah. Well, no, okay. well, let it's not a bad idea. Let's just see if there are if there are questions, and if not, maybe if you do talk, then it might open okay. things up a bit. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions that they want to either type or just raise their hand? Um. Um. Well, can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, my mind was going in all sorts of different directions. Um, but I was kind of thinking about power and how it plays out kind of quite differently across these three different contexts. And, and Rebecca spoke particularly um, about re re relationality Um and I was, I suppose in a way, this is a, a bit of a question for everyone, but maybe it's just amused. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, but for, for you, Beck, I was sort of thinking about how you, when you're taking such a relational approach, how you then go back to thinking about some of the things Alan was talking about, such as threats to citizenship and uh, I guess the way that legal frameworks um have been so important historically in creating access for certain types of citizenship, you know, and how does one balance the the rights of, from certainly in Western thinking? I mean, anyway, you, so that's that was what I was thinking in relation to, to what you were saying. But then conversely for you, Alan, I was sort of thinking about um, the ways in which l legal power particularly might work differently potentially in less structured um, environments. So while the football stadium, um, I think, is a, is a really great example to, th to think through those structured environments, what happens when it's kids kicking a football around in the park um, or people doing parkour or, or skateboarding or, or, you know, doing these much more informal kinds of activities. There's a surprise that I'm bringing that up. Um, yeah. And how, 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 might, how might the legal frameworks operate in those kinds of contexts to promote citizens' rights rather than um, being like a barrier, if you like? for access or you said access pathways i think was your a term you used yeah um and tommy sorry i'm, I'm on a roll now um <laughs> I, sorry oh uh, yeah and 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 tommy so i guess one of the things that i was thinking about as you were talking around um you know you talk you started off by speaking a little bit about what drives greenwashing and then you kind of finished off thinking about power relations and how that shapes 
environmental sustainability claim. So in, in a sense that that loop and I guess I, it just made me think about where 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 is the power lying in greenwashing? Is it just about corporate power and institutional power or are there other spaces or, or places where power might be emerging? So I'm sorry, that was a bit of a whew, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Who's first, Belinda? Maybe Alan? Uh, me, did you say? Yeah, is that okay, Alan? Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I think you're absolutely right, Belinda. The the, uh, the 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 question of attributing so so much to 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 um, the the the. the To, to the, the the more formal side of, of things, you know, articulating um, le legislative details in a variety of situations, so so on. It it's, it it, do, it, do, it does seem to then suggest a neglect of exactly what you say: in, informal kinds of activities, uh, spaces, and you know, it, it, something like the stadium is very, very, very focused indeed. And, and, and that, that's why the article is so strong in, in a way. So mm. <laughs> it can create legal pathways because, because it, in, in a way it's a sort of uh, highly focused element within, a, within a, a, a credible jurisdiction, if you like. Because there are jurisdictional questions that you have to ask also mm. about, about um, legal frameworks. And, of course, legal framework. Uh, vary massively across different different societies and, and so mm. on. So, so I, I think it's really important where where, where you can m make make this make make the case for for the use of uh, well intervention within the, the legal framework within the discourses of, of, of the legal in in, in terms of uh, essentially to get back to a little bit to to the UN's obsession with this with cultural rights. And then the crossover mm. of, of, of um, sport and leisure and so on uh, uh, in, into intercultural rights. Uh, I, I think I think it, it can enable us to 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 do some really really highly focused and, and I think seriously theoretical and analytical work about where things can work in, in that sense. And, and of course. Uh, perhaps in the background is my own. It's not an obsession, but it's a, it's a, it's an expertise on on the history of FIFA and, mm. and the nature of Olympism, which Tommy himself was was talking about. Fascinating mm. actually, about some of those dimensions of of that. Of, 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 you know of how 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 the bod like. Bodies such as the IOC, obviously not just FIFA, but a range of bodies across across global sports governance, uh, manipulate the nature of particular uh, no, particular uh, aspects of, of, of the legal side, i.e., the internal and the external. The argument that these are our statutes, we've had them in FIFA since 1904, lay off, and and and, and find they find a particular home, of course, in the supine nature of. Of, 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 of legal actions at times in, in, in the Swiss state. So, so that, that, that you can be much more specific like that. So I, I think you're dead right to raise these questions. But of course, the, 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 these open spaces, you know, the, these informal spaces, um, there is a potential tension there, isn't there, about the use of mm. them? I mean, to think on, 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 on the most... On the most kind of local level, you know, uh, municipal parks, yeah, that would be fantastic. And they they are not directly the product of particular arguments about about legal responsibilities or particular forms of of, of, of um, legislation, but they but they are they they are, they are there in a certain sort of way because they're part of the bigger potentially kind of collective openness. To to um to to what what people can do near, quite near their homes and so on um and, and when they can do it so so you know yeah. the and, and what's to think about like what's, that they're very interesting yeah what's considered legitimate in those spaces and like you were saying about the idea of what what's an what's appropriate consumption of those spaces and what's considered too risky and all, those kind yeah. of debates come out there as well yeah interesting thanks Alan.
Um, I think there's another question related to that, but we'll, we'll let the other two speak and then we'll come, um, Manuel, then we'll come back to your question. Yeah. Um, Tommy, do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to say that or admit that, that I don't I don't consider myself as an expert expert in uh, environmental issues and certainly not the greenwashing. But uh, in our special issue, we didn't we don't have any kind of specific understanding of power there. But I think most of the articles adhere to some kind of uh, relational understanding of power some from Foucault to Bourdieu to Luke's for instance uh, so yeah I think most of them yeah but there's different ways of understanding uh, power in these articles um, when it comes to greenwashing there's at least one article that directly uh, uh, writes on this topic. Uh, there's one article on uh, greenwashing in motorsports. Mm. And they basically look at how uh, the organization behind Formula One and Formula E, the electric car race, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, I'm not very much into motorsports e. myself, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but how they use the Formula E to kind of greenwash uh, Formula mm. One to say that, uh, well, look, we have Formula E, it's electric cars, it's clean, and how the organization uses this to greenwash motorsports uh, at all. So that's pretty much power from an organizational level that they're talking about in that article yeah great thank you um rebecca emmanuel do, do you want to go ask did you want to jump in if it follows on it makes sense did, um yeah go for it who me yeah me, Yes, okay. Me. Yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, no, I, 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 I don't know if, if I felt that my comment was, I don't know that my comment was particularly related to what Tommy's just said, although, although we did mention, you know, different understandings of power and, you know, that, that that's great. Um, but I suppose um, I could bounce off uh, the kind of later point that, Alan made about, for instance, you know, public parks and so on. I suppose that, you know, I was, uh, and 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 I'm sorry, Olive, I, I don't have at this point much to kind of bounce off, uh, you know, your your discussion of multi-species leisure, although because primarily I hadn't really much thought about it, but actually this is really fascinating. So hopefully there will be <laughs> much more about this. But anyway, sorry, I'll 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 shut I'll 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 be quick. Just to say that um you know um certainly our the situation in, in the UK and I think in other parts of, of Europe is that access to leisure and sport resources is um it, it, it is is very uh, tenuous now, you know, uh, withdrawal of funding uh, and so on. And so therefore you know, uh, and and people can't, re and this is allied, of course, to the responsabilization, the individualization of of uh, sport participation, physical activity participation, and I feel now that we're even beyond the question of right or uh, any form of legislation that would protect people's access to to uh, leisure spaces and leisure participation, given that it's now uh, much more uh, moralized and 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 based on um, financial uh, resources, you know, financial capital, uh, and so that was really just my my comment that um, you know uh, I I feel that um, actually. Uh, we are now um, um, denying access to, uh, or at least access to sport and, and leisure resources is at risk 
um, because of the withdrawal of funding and and um, the um, a, a, a range of um, the, and neoliberal arguments, which we now know um, are are toxic. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, no, well, it did to me. Rebecca, should we should we jump back to you and then we can kind of see where the yeah, discussion yeah. takes us? So um, in terms of rights, um, yeah, it's a challenging perspective because, and there's a great paper by Hamilton and Ford and the title of the paper escapes my mind at the moment, but Alan, I think you'd enjoy it. And it's about the human right to leisure and its impact on shark lives. And so in Australia and other countries as well, in Reunion Island, this is a big issue, um, sharks are being killed because surfers in particular, swimmers have a different take on this, but surfers um, ha have for a long time. That they'll say things like, I have a right to feel safe in the water when I go out. I've had people say that to me in Australia. So we can see, start to see a few intersections here with around rights, but also the kinds of power relations that shape those rights and who has them, including in this case, whiteness and masculinity um, in particular in that case. And I, I, yeah, I think masculinity is really important in the discussion of killing animals to feel safe. Um, but yeah, so there's this, I think it's difficult because animal rights and multi-species rights, ecological rights, let's let's say, are often sacrificed to, to as human rights being above them. And this is just an absolute manifestation of the enduring human nature binary that shapes European philosophy and thinking. And it's, you know, we know that people are part of nature and we can say it, we, we know it. But that's very abstract. I'm talking to you from an office that's completely internal in a building that, that has been bug sprayed to death, you know, literal death for the, any critters. And, um, you know, so in practice, these things don't actually happen. I mean, we're talking to each other from technologies that involve kobolds that's been dug up by orphaned children. You know, So th these practices are very extractive and, and the way that we think about our rights can become very detriment extractive but also very detrimental to the non-human world none of this is a revelation <laughs> um but it is really difficult in these discussions of human rights where there are people as ellen's described in particular who are treated so horrifically by sporting industries <laughs> and you know cultures in a lot of a lot of the time um but we do, I mean, sports still treats animals as nature. We still have mascot animals as mascots. We have Indigenous people and, and cultural like um, ancestors and as mascots in sporting um, teams. The IOC, as, as Tommy's been talking about, um, you know, they now have an environmental plat sustainability kind of platform that they run a pillar, you know, of their, how wonderful they are. And look, I, I'm not an IOC fan and I doubt there's many here, but of course I get sucked in and I watched all of the Olympics and, you know, blah, blah. But but what the interesting thing at this Olympics was the scene was the front and centre thing that was promoted for this Olympics, like constantly. It was the almost the mascot of the Paris Olympics. And yet at the same time, and Tommy would know all about this and, and Belinda in Tahiti, they were, they were proposing to build a new judging stand that would be for a short event, and we all know the Olympi Olympics, Olympics do this, that would destroy the reef or cause great harm to the reef. So there was real opposition to this. There's like example after example of, the, of where and how human rights are constantly put over ecological rights in ways that are really, really short term. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and also, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, no, I won't get to that. But yeah, it's... um. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, um, Rebecca. Some um, comments in the chat um, just um, saying, yeah, that it's kind of really interesting thinking about rights in, in a completely different way. And then also a, a comment about um, the fact that different, I mean, particularly 
indigenous communities um, have these very different, I'm trying to find the comment now, different relationships um, to rights and responsibilities, of course, and that, that you know, that that maybe takes the takes this relationality into a different um Can different I way add to of that too, Belinda, in terms of yeah. safety though as well, because there's also we talk about cultural safety and in places like Australia and of course Aotearoa as well, cultural safety is actually about Indigenous dispossession as well. So when we do sport in places or we access places, there's increasing attention being paid to cultural safety of, of traditional owners and first peoples as well. So safety becomes a very, very broad word Um In different contexts. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's absolutely right, and for me, at least, that's I think one of the one of the the real strengths of thinking in the way that you are about these interactions is it it pushes us towards towards rela relationality in ways um, that that's really helpful. But then it's like the challenge of how how you. I suppose, and weigh up the different perspectives within, within that. Anyway, I'll shut up. Um, does any any of the people who've written things in the chat want to speak to those? N no obligation to, but very welcome to if you'd like to. J Jamie, did you want to say anything more on that? Or, or Beck, did you want to? Can you see that comment? Yeah, cool. I mean, I'll jump in actually and thinking about Tommy when you were talking about the F1 and greenwashing. Um, it's so interesting that F1. I was last year in London, there's a really big conference. It's very industry based and very commercial called Sport, Posit Sport Positive or something. It's on now, actually. Um, yeah, Sport Positive. And it's really focused on industry. There's, n there's not many researchers go. I went, I went last year, people from sport management were the only people there. But you're right, there was a huge, the, the industries that were most represented were F1 and golf courses. And F1 is, I think, fascinating because it has such a, like, a precedent of limiting the performance of the sport for safety, for human safety. So they limit the capacity of the car to go fast in order to protect the people inside it. So it's kind of, I found it really interesting because they really want to push how much work they're doing to try and address, you know, it's probably like the greenwashing aspect because they can't, it's an impossible task. But with that precedent of limiting performance for human safety, it's, it doesn't seem like a huge jump for, you know, ecological or planetary safety and health as well, you know, that, that I mean, it is a huge jump. But <laughs> um, And the other one was golf courses and golf courses are positioning themselves as biodiversity hotspots that should be protected because, of course, there's a lot of protest often about the space that golf courses take up and the privilege that's associated with that. But, yeah, Tommy, I was thinking a lot about when when you were talking, I was thinking about those examples. Mm. Interesting. Mm. L Louise, did you want to ask that question? Yeah, I I will ask a question, actually, because it will link to what I, um, I'm thinking of saying, although I haven't. Finally formalised, I'm going to say. <laughs> it's question, it started out with a question to Beck, and, but it could be to, to all and to anyone in the room. And I think that some of the research that people are talking about, Jamie's work and some other people's work uh, around exploring human experiences that then clearly have non-human relational aspects to them. And coming back to a kind of um, human rights perspective, um, and, and particularly a cultural rights perspective, and whether or not that legal and political framing is too limp. I mean, it's important, right, to understand um, human rights. It's what we all do as sociologists, really, even if we don't explicitly say we are. Um, but but are we are we at a kind of watershed moment back where those human rights perspectives, even with a cultural rights understanding, are too limited in? making sense of human, non-human relationships, power dynamics, issues of sustainability, planetary health. And actually one of our tasks as sociologists is to advocate for a shift in those legal and political framings in order to bring that into more alignment. You know, I think it's, it's useful, yeah. but possibly limited now. Yeah, I think it's super useful, but 
it cha- as soon as you open up human to be this interconnected category sure. where to be human is to always be in relation to. So human health is entirely tied to and reliant upon and interconnected with planetary health. It's con- yeah. completely connected to the quality of the air, the quality of the water, the soil quality, you know, like the health of the animals that, that live yeah. with us so that we can eat them. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. but also they, yeah. like fungi, fungi creates nutritious soil. Right. So it's once you kind of think like that, then everything starts to open up. But I think it is really useful because actually you can't always think like that on every topic. Like I think sometimes you have to come back and I think like it's so the human rights perspective is very valuable when you start thinking about particular kinds of power relations that Alan, you've been talking about. Right. Which are, you know, a lot to do with sometimes governance. Um, I mean, I, I do find it. Like this now that I'm really in it, and it's taken a long time to to get to where I am kind of working, a lot of thinking and reading and pushing myself. But it's not, it's not. <laughs> it's really hard, yeah, it's <laughs> and, not, and sometimes not. it always like you start pulling one thread, and then all the others come, and you go, oh crap. <laughs> What is going to happen here? So actually coming back to sometimes thinking about the relations between people in the ways that you're talking about, Ellen, I think is really valuable. But as long as we think about law, L-A-W law, mm. as coming from a Judeo-Christian background, if you know, Judeo-Christian morals of that kind of like European thinking as well, like if, if if that kind of philosophical tradition is always going to shape the way we make laws, then it's going to be really, it's yeah, always yeah. going to remain yeah. very limited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the be- recognising different worldviews and uh, in this space is, I think, clearly really important, something that's difficult. But, but it's not just recognising them, it's actually integrating them. Integrating, and yeah, agreed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Can I ask a little question? Am I audible at the moment? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I I still believe that that what we need to do to to to, to do in a, in a way um, develop and cultivate a, a sense of the the, the the potential importance of of, of leisure and cult, cultural activities and so on in life. I I, I still I still think we have to employ a term I don't think any of us have used today. I'm using it in one of my big FIFA articles that's about to be published in the in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies. <laughs> but it, it but it's agency. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I think perhaps when we talk about relationality, it, it's, it's, a, it's a certain kind of version, isn't it, of, of, or, or expansion of, 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 of trying to understand forms of, of agency in, 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 in social relations. So I, I do believe, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of Tony Giddens from 50, 60 years ago, <laughs> but I, I do believe that understanding agency and its complexities and the dynamics that you can identify in balancing the yeah, form of agency in the, in the overall power dynamic is, is, is what, what we are really talking about at times. So, so I do, and, and in, in order to, you know, you think about agency and, 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 and identify perhaps some forms where you think, yeah, that, that there is this thrust of, of, of critique or something in, in say, the, the, the protests that are made about the, the sheer um, hypocrisy of, of, of Olympic discourses in Paris 2024. You know, uh, you, you, you talk about that and then suddenly there is no presence of, of the protests. You know, I spent two and a half weeks looking at this and living in Montmartre and, and talking and watching. And then it's quite depressing going from a, a mega event of a wonderful, say, basketball final be, be, between, between the United States and France and walking back to where I was staying via areas where there's no sense whatsoever of the existence of, a polit- of, a, of, 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 of the Olympic Games, where, where at night at times, if, if you came back from a, le- a late event, I, I walked past people sleeping under bridges 
you know, asking asking for money in, on, on the edges of Montmartre, you know, where, where many of the outdoor activities, cyclists and so on, were coming. And, and, and I think we have to retain a, a sense of trying to understand um, the, 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 the things that must be contested because the evidence is there. But, but, but um, it, it is quite remarkable um, what what claims were made within Paris. It was quite a spectacle to be there. There's a lot going on. It's quite exhausting, as some of you know, to spend time at these big events in, in, in the way that um, we as sociologists do, as, as not just as sports fans. But have, have you got any views that, on, 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 on this? Because I, I think we, we have to get a sense of, of, of the credibility of certain forms of agency, for instance, that develop into to, in, into effective kinds of, of, of protest and and, and, and incrementally um, larger kind of uh, more expanded profiles of, of, of these kind of critically informed types of protest. Does that make some sense? I mean, is it, is it, is this is this a, an issue that we really need? To keep uh, um, to keep aware, aware of and, and work on, or, or am I just kind of digging in my own little back garden? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no don't I, think... I think it's so crucial, Anne, yeah. because it's framed by you know you talked about the report that came out yesterday, and I'll talk about it in my in my closing comments. Um, but you know the core business of what we do as sociologists is unpicking those relationships of power and agency resistance, challenge, change. Um, and I think we need to return to that theoretically and empirically. Um, and you kind of started it all off, Alan, and I think we've kind of moved in and between really, really, you know, um, detailed analyses of power at times. And I think we need to almost bring power back into this in, in all sorts of, of different ways. It's, it's absolutely fundamental to understanding who has the right to play, who gets to play in what way, in what safe environments, and equally who doesn't, and what those yeah. relationships are all about. So I think it's really fundamental. I think it has, through that work that we did around the report that's come out, Alan, you know, this cultural rights perspective seems so obvious, and yet sport has not been a part of that legal and political framework at a UN level or, or anywhere else. You know, this kind of notion of the autonomy of sport, and it sits outside of politics and, uh, you know, uh, legal uh, discussions, um, you know, seems to have meant that it hasn't, it, you know, this, is, this is the first report by the United Nations on, on a rights perspective in sport ever. I, I find that, I find that quite incredible. So I agree mm. with you, I think, and, and that gives us an in as sociologists to bring our brilliant thinking, our work into that space. Um, you know, it's always been there, but a bit on the fringes. I think we need to Get right in there again. Mm -hmm. Just a thought as you were speaking, Louise. I mean, it just made, made me, I mean, maybe it's sort of a night, I don't know if this is naive, but I'm just thinking about how legal frameworks don't seem to have helped or maybe it's the absence of that you're speaking about in terms of the rights of some of the most disenfranchised and I'm thinking maybe like particularly at the moment around trans rights in sport mm -hmm. and how politicized those debates have been and yet legal frameworks seem not to be able to provide <laughs> solutions to those challenges and you know people with protected rights particularly around other protected rights, like dis dis certain types of disabilities and again yet yeah, in the sporting sphere they, those things seem to be able to be pushed to the side so easily yeah i agree um, I think the, the, the frameworks need you know challenging and um and that takes a long time you know but but yeah. we know that you know legal and political discourse and decision making is so contextual it's so temporally and spatially orientated and just because it takes a long time though doesn't mean that we shouldn't be advocating and promoting and and yeah no no yeah, yeah. And they also, um, when cultural attitudes, <laughs> you know, are lagging <laughs> behind what we think should be happening, then laws are essential and they've been, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's very imperfect, but there's there's laws and um, 
policies being put in place to ensure that women have access to resources. Ruth will know more about that in the Australian context, especially in Victoria, where the government's now said if councils don't have equitable access to resources for women, then they'll lose their funding. I think that's a simplified way to say it, but yeah. So I think they're essential because, you know, some it's like in politics, you know, they have quote, quotas for women and they suck yeah. and we don't want them, but they have a, a, a role. Mm-hmm. Can I just say something? Of course. Yes. When it comes to legal frameworks, if and now I'm getting back to more environmental issues, if legal frameworks doesn't work, I'm not sure what works. I think what, what, what part of our special issue here is about uh, kind of unraveling sustainability claims. And I think one thing that we have to do also is to unpick our own hypocrisy when it comes to these issues. For instance, uh, last year, I was at the ISSA conference in Ottawa to speak 15 minutes about sustainability. How hypocritical is that? And we do it all, all the time. (laughs) <laughs> As academics, I travel, I'm going to Morocco to surf in a few weeks. And so I, my actions are not very good for the environment, but I still do it. So I think mm-hmm. we can't, what we need is, I don't know, uh, policy solutions and legislations that are works. But how to do it, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my point is that we can't rely on human beings uh, changing their way of behavior, I think. Mm. Yeah. It's a very challenging thought there for you, Tommy. You know, it's, um, you know, don't, don't, don't look at your diary and your flight schedule too often. <laughs> As an as um a global academic, you know, I've, it's uh, we've had privileges from this. We get invitations. We 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 we, we travel have traveled the world uh, talking about these issues. And, and you're right. You are correct. I'll not use the word right. It's confusing. And you are you are correct and accurate in what you say. To it. It, I think it also that. It, it comes back to that point around what laws are based on, like what, what belief systems are laws based on as well. And mm. if they continue to be on the same belief systems and nothing's ever changing, then the ideologies that underpin it, the, the epistemologies and ontologies aren't going to change either. And, yeah, you know, I agree with you, Tommy. Like I think change of law only takes us so far. I mean, I live in Australia. If I want to come to... ISSA, my carbon footprint, I now, my thing is like my carbon footprint is your carbon footprint, European friends, because none of you come here, so you all get to be really pleased (laughs) about taking trains and boats, and I'm very happy for you, and everyone's very proud to talk about that, but if I want to come and participate in a conference, then my carbon footprint's much higher, and I donate that to yours, so it's a collective one, I feel, um, in terms of the industry. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hmm. Um, the, the but, you know, even this, we're still using, like, we're still burning the earth by even having this conversation online, right? I mean, like, AI is, like, a nightmare environmentally, let alone the human rights abuses that are tied up in that. But meeting online has impacts too. It's not a perfect solution, right. even though we defer to it. Sorry, Alan, I started talking when you were. Yeah. So I, I just began thinking about a little bit about some of the other articles in, in our um special issue and, and uh, when I when I last was gazing at some of these things I, I noticed that the, the most the most uh, consulted of, of, of the whole of them was one on children's holidays yeah, because because it, it's it's actually about the right for for, for children um young children to to um to to, uh, to have support for experiences, holidays, and so on. Uh, it's linked to school meals debates as well. <laughs> but um, 
in, in, in those times, which are quite long, aren't they, in, in, in summer vacations and so on. It, it's, and and that, that is perceived in that article by, by the, the, the people who've got more, more readership in that article than any of the other seven, actually, is what I was noting. Uh, it's a big issue. I mean, people are concerned, aren't they, with, with what you can create. In turn, and that's, an, that's also an environmental question as well, about, uh, about in, in a descriptive sense in terms of the word um, environmental there, uh, 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 about, uh, about uh, opportunities and, and, and so on but for, to, to keep one of those perceived rights as the, the, the right to leisure and, or rest or something like that. But, it, but it, stri it strikes me that we have to, we have to yeah, we, 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 we have to see the, the different sort of, of levels at which one can apply some of these analytical and theoretical um, frameworks. Yeah, we got so this is one generation speaking. You know, in, in, in that case, it, 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 it's uh, it speaks looking to provide for an emerging generation um, on, on what seems like a rather uh, petty level at first, but it's not. It's absolutely fundamental to to people's experience of what we are at the heart of things talking about. You know, leisure, physical activity, and sport, and food. In that case, you know. So, um, so, so that, I, I did find that quite interesting. That, that that's a bit, good piece of work being done by the team that did that article coming out of Durham University. Mm. I think we should probably yeah. move to Louise because we're sort of near the end of our time slot. Okay. Shall I go? Yeah. Wow. So I've got to follow all of that. Um, I'll tell you what this feels like is, is and, and uh, this is in no way about the quality of my art. You know, when you've got an artist in the room and they're immediately drawing all of the um, kind of thing, the, the themes and the issues, and they produce this kind of uh, br brilliant piece of uh, artistic representation of what's going on. I feel a bit like that, but I don't think it's going to look quite so beautiful as one of those. But let me um, let me give it a go. So... First of all, thanks to Alan and Beck and Tommy for their expert insights and to Belinda for leading um, and to all of you for, for participating in what has been a really vibrant discussion. As we've heard, the focus on human rights and human responsibilities is complex. It's shaped by temporal and spatial context. It's characterized by complex power dynamics between and within groups of humans and non-humans. I don't need to repeat any of that. But what I wanted to emphasize um, is how timely and important these debates are, how there's a significant opportunity for sociologists of, sociologists of sport, like everyone in the room, to make a contribution to thinking about um, applying a rights-based approach for advancing knowledge and taking, as Alan said, a critical stance um, to making a difference to decision-making and human experience, also in relation to, to non-humans, uh, when we see and know about injustice, discrimination, abuse, um, and we know that that is ever present in the sporting sphere. Um, the timeliness of all of this is writ large, um, as Alan intimated with the publication yesterday of um, a report by the UN. I'll put a link in the chat at the end. Um, it's the report of the Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. It's led by a colleague of mine at Brunel, Professor Alexander Zanthaki, and, and was informed by an expert panel of which Alan and I were a part. Um, and what it indicated is that um, a formal human rights perspective tells us that it is a basic minimum um, that we have, humans have, and we can debate that, a universal and indivisible right to dignity, fairness, equality, tolerance and respect. In the introduction to the report, sport, it identifies sport specifically, but I would add leisure here, like human rights are a common language of humanity. Fairness, respect and equal opportunity is at the core of sport in principle. In practice, we know that doesn't always happen. Standards of human rights have not always been applied. A rights perspective, I think, analytically, um, uh, enables a framework for explaining the inextricable link between rights, responsibility and resistance and agency, as Alan um, noted, recognising that rights do not happen in a vacuum, but they're framed by relationships of power, as Tommy quite rightly highlighted, between humans and between humans and non-humans. 
What's central to all um, the talks, I think, and to the United Nations report, is the importance of a cultural rights perspective. Not a broad human rights perspective, yes, but more specifically, I think what the discussions uh, we led to was the importance of a cultural rights perspective. A set of principles that seek to protect the rights of groups of people, but their diverse cultures through the conditions of non-discrimination, dignity and respect. Cultural rights in sport, I think, can serve to help protect the right of people to express their humanity, their values, their beliefs, their language, knowledge and their way of life. And I think that brings in or has the potential to bring in the non-human element as well. I'm not sure it actually does in the way that it's formally written about, but I think there's potential there to work within that framework from a cultural rights perspective. And as Beck's talk so expertly highlighted, this does not mean relations of human and non-human species are absent from the debate. Rather, we can bring them in and we can recognise that sporting practices in diverse environments um, operate at the intersections of the relationships between humans and non-humans. And I think, as Tommy recognised, the issue of the sustainability of those relationships is at the core of our cultural life and the rights within that. In the end, a focus on sport and rights and cultural rights confirms the importance of applying this cultural rights perspective. The mandate for all of us here, I think, in this cultural rights perspective really does reflect the way we already work, but it formalises and invites us to be a bigger and stronger part of the legal, political, community framework for understanding all of this. And for me, I think we have a duty to be part of the decision-making platforms about who gets to play, why, when, how and where, and crucially who and what is excluded or unsafe or abused in any way in that process. Sociologists of sport have a central role beyond simply being a witness or offering a theoretical critique in identifying and mitigating the risks of human and non-human rights violations in culturally appropriate ways um, and attending to the sustainability of the relationships so that we ensure participants are afforded the benefits that sport and leisure can bring that we know are possible. I think my hope for a right-based approach and a culturally rights-based approach, and it's not perfect, but my hope is that it can reignite and open up discussion and debate, as we've done here, about some of the most challenging human rights violations of the 21st century, and we all know what they are. But I also think it might be helpful in understanding the complexity of rights, responsibilities and relationships between humans and non-humans that are such a challenge in the contemporary sport and leisure spaces that we know. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. Very thought provoking. Um, do we want to open that for any comments or do we really need to? I think we need to close. close. Okay. I will do that then. Um, so, look, just another huge thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Louise. Um, thank you to the ISSA virtual um, for this initiative, uh, particularly Parissa, who was here at the beginning. It was three in the morning for her. So, um, you know, th thanks to them for setting this up. I think it's actually worked out to be a really cool format. Um, sorry for people probably in the US and, and North America, uh, for once their time zone wasn't prioritized. So, uh, but, but they, they can, you can all listen uh, to this once it's um, up on the, the website. Do check out the special issues in Annals of Leisure. Um, and I've been asked to also uh, remind you that if you are an ISSA member, and your membership has lapsed, please do <laughs> renew it. And if not, please do join. There you go. I've done my corporate bit. Thank you very much to everyone for, for your participation.